tree farts are contributing to greenhouse gases. A man built his own x-ray machine after he got a large hospital bill. And warning, there are counterfeit Wonka bars out there. Watch out for the fake Wonka bars. These are the weird stories for Tuesday on Weird AF News, the only daily weird news podcast hosted by a comedian inside a closet in Los Angeles. (laughs) Tree farts. Yes, tree farts are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. It's the sound of science. Let's learn a little bit about tree farts. I didn't know they could fart. It says here, if a tree farts in the forest, does it make a sound? Hey, good joke. No, no, the tree doesn't actually make a sound. Damn it. I was hoping they really made a fart. It doesn't make a sound, but it adds a little bit of greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. And that's concerning. Let's find out what's going on and what can be done about it. Gonna have to put a stop to these tree farts. Gas is released by dead trees. That's what a tree fart is. Tree farts account for roughly one-fifth of the greenhouse gases emitted by skeletal, marshy, dead forests along the coasts. These emissions pale in comparison with other sources of greenhouse emissions. But an accurate accounting is necessary to get a full picture of where climate warming gases come from. So researchers have made a report in an article in Biogeochemistry. I guess that's a... It's a scientific journal. Biogeochemistry? I don't even know that existed. I sucked at chemistry. Never mind biogeochemistry. That sounds very difficult. I don't even think I could handle geochemistry. Never mind biogeochemistry. I can't even handle the mystery. <laughs> Never mind the chemistry. Oh, I was terrible at these sorts of classes. It says here a team of ecologists went sniffing for some tree farts. <laughs> <laughs> Where did they go sniffing for tree farts? Hey guys, I think I smell one over here. Oh boy, here it is, a big one over here, this tree fart. Okay, so this is where you can find tree farts, guys, in a place called a ghost forest. Have you ever heard of such a thing? A ghost forest? It sounds amazing. Ghost forests form when salt water from rising sea levels poisons a forest, leaving behind a marsh of standing dead trees. Those are pretty freaky. These phantom ecosystems are expected to expand with climate change. But they're not really clear exactly how they will contribute to the world's carbon budget. Oh yeah, there's going to be more dead forests as the oceans rise, as the remaining glaciers melt and the salt water rises. You're in trouble, Florida. You might as well get out now. You're going to be up to your chin in salt water and ghost forests and tree farts. Here's a quote from Karen Geeden, a coastal ecologist. The emergence of ghost forests is one of the biggest changes happening in response to sea level rising. As forests convert to wetlands, we expect our long time scales that's going to represent a substantial carbon sink. She says, since wetlands store more carbon than forests. <laughs> she's, got a, she's got a lisp in the story. I gave her that lisp. I don't know if she has one in real life. She's talking about um, what could be a major greenhouse gas source, what's going on. Because the trees decay and they stop taking up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. You guys learned about photosynthesis, correct? To better understand how ghost forests pass gas into the atmosphere, the researchers measured greenhouse gases wafting off dead trees and soil in some ghost forests on a peninsula in North Carolina. We got Melinda Martinez. She's a wetland ecologist. She says, it's kind of eerie. It's eerie out there in the ghost forest. But Melinda ain't afraid of no ghosts. Oh, no. In 2018 and 2019, she actually measured CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions from dead trees using a portable gas analyzer that she wore on her back. She said, I definitely look like a ghostbuster. (laughs) Measuring greenhouse gases from the trees is kind of like measuring the last breath of the forests, she says. The dead trees don't emit a ton, but they are important to a ghost forest's overall emissions. She coined the term tree farts to describe the dead trees' greenhouse gas emissions. It's pretty funny. She's a scientist with a great sense of humor. Now, in the grand scheme of carbon emissions, ghost forests' role might be minor. Tree farts, for instance, have nothing on cow burps. 
a single dairy cow can admit up to 27 grams of methane, which is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. They emit 27 grams of methane per hour. That's big time. Uh, But it behooves scientists to study the ghost tree farts as well to get a full picture of what's going on on the planet. Yes, that's right. We must prepare ourselves for the fallout of all of these tree farts and cow farts. Uh, My suggestion is you try to get up into space. Yeah, I think that's the future for us. Just get on up there. And uh, how do you get up into space? Well, you guys, just make friends with Elon Musk. That's how you do it. Duh. Come on now. A guy built his own x-ray machine after getting a large hospital bill. After receiving a medical treatment that included a round of antibiotics and an x-ray, Californian Will Osman thought he got stuck with a $70,000 hospital bill. Luckily, his insurance covered most of the bill, but that still left him on the hook for about $2,500. Here's a quote from Will. I avoided surgery, bro, but they still billed me like $70,000. This bill included an abdominal CT scan, some medication, a couple nights in a hospital room, you know, exorbitant costs, hospital treatments and procedures, man. That's when Will decided, I'm going to build my own fully functional homemade x-ray machine. That's right. Will is a YouTuber and an engineer. He did this. He made a video about it. I watched it. It's pretty intense. I'm going to post it in the Patreon. Or you can just Google it. In less than a day, Will was able to build an entire x-ray machine. In less than a day, you hear that? Although he says gathering the materials for the project took a few months. According to Will, the hardest part of building the x-ray machine was working on the energy-converting glass x-ray tube. uh, He used a 20-year-old dental x-ray head. Will says he removed the high-voltage circuit and wired the tube to his own high-level, high-voltage power supply. Then I used like a low voltage variable power supply, bro, to drive the tube's filament, which like controls the quantity of x-rays generated, dude. It's hard to see x-rays though, bro, so a special sheet of material called an intensifying screen is used to convert the x-rays into visible light in case you don't know, bro. Then those photons are captured by a DSLR camera I chose for its extreme low light sensitivity, bro. As for safety, Will is very much aware of the hazards that come with building and using a device that emits radiation, of course. X-rays are energy waves capable of passing through your skin and your bones and your forehead and your pee-pee. When a person gets hit with an X-ray, their body absorbs some of that radiation, which over time can make somebody susceptible to developing cancer in the future. But our man Will is very careful. For my entire time owning this tube, man, it's been powered on for less than 20 seconds, you know? Generating 2 MA of x-rays at 60 kV, which isn't anything crazy, bro. I specifically used a low-light camera with a long exposure so I could capture quality image with less x-rays, my dude. Plus, Will says that a person is exposed to more cosmic radiations actually on a transcontinental flight than from his x-ray. So Will isn't worried about exposure. Likewise, it's reported that we're exposed to natural sources of radiation in our daily lives anyways, with the average person in the U.S. receiving approximately 3 epi. MSV, a unit of radiation dose, of natural radiation annually. Will says the real concern was the high voltage used to power his x-ray. Oh man, I used 40 kV silicone insulated wire and surrounded that with additional silicone tubing, bro. Then I just stayed away from the tube during operation, bro, man. You gotta stay far away, man. After the initial test, the giant 2 millimeter lead sheet was placed around the tube. Since building the This x-ray, Will has taken the machine apart since he only built it for demonstration purposes and he doesn't intend to use it again unless he gets another $70,000 hospital bill. That's the end of the story. And I love it. I love when people take stuff into their own hands like this. They go, you know what? Hey, hospital, you're charging me way too much for some shit I can do at my my house, possibly in my garage with a little wiring and a UFO, UFO parts from that saucer that landed in my backyard last July. And then they take it upon themselves to avoid large hospital bills and do it themselves. Now, I know it can be dangerous. Of course, you got to know what you're doing. This guy's an engineer, though. He knows what's up. You heard him. This guy's, a, this guy's brilliant. But we're, like, talking about x-rays here. This is, like, an extreme. Think about some of the smaller things that they do over there that they charge you thousands of dollars for that you could do at your house. You know? Look, we already know how to pull our own teeth, too, right? That's the thing where all, you guys know how to pull your own tooth, right? You tie a string, right? And you put the string on the doorknob, and then you slam the door. 
You know, like Bugs Bunny. You're probably wondering, well, what else can we do that a doctor will charge us a lot of money for? Uh, I can tell you I took out my own stitches once. Yeah. Well, I saw the bill they gave me when they put the stitches in. I was like, it's going to be at least half of that to get them out. Screw that. I took them out in my, in my bathroom in New York City. But there was a witness. There was a witness. Now, of course, I don't condone you doing all these things. Of course, Weird AF News doesn't condone you taking your health into your own hands quite like that. That's an extreme. You know, what can I suggest you do? Drink your juice. Do some push-ups and sit-ups. Avoid the hospital altogether if you can by taking great care of your body. Ding. You like podcasts? You're listening to my podcast. Maybe you thought to yourself, I'd like to make a podcast. Too difficult. No, not with Anchor. Anchor has free creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. Anchor distributes your podcast to Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. They have advertising integration, so you can even make a little money off your podcast. Everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And good luck with your podcast. Good luck with your creation. Good luck with your life, man. Warning, warning, do not eat the counterfeit Wonka bars. Repeat, do not eat those counterfeit Wonka bars. The Food Standards Agency is warning members of the public not to buy or eat counterfeit Wonka bars, which are being sold in shops and online across the country. Oh, but what if I get the golden ticket? I gotta eat the Wonka bar for the golden ticket, don't I? In case you guys are unfamiliar with Wonka bars because you live in in a pit or a cave... Or if you're Henry David Thoreau and you're living in a lean-to in the middle of the forests of New England, there was a movie called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and Wonka bars were center stage. The counterfeit bars in this story may be unsafe to eat, they want you to know, as there is a possibility they're being produced or repackaged by what they're calling an unregistered business, and by individuals who could be contravening food hygiene labeling and traceability laws. Some counterfeit Wonka bars removed from sale have been found to contain allergens, oh no, which weren't listed on the label. Oh man, if I bought bit into a Wonka bar and there was almonds in it, but it didn't say almonds, I'd be pretty upset. Of course, this poses a major health risk to anyone who suffers from a food allergy or intolerance, such as yours truly, your host, allergic to tree nuts. That's right. I can't just go biting into some chocolate bar willy-nilly. I can't just go up to the dessert table at a wedding reception and just dive right in. I don't know what I'm putting in my mouth, all right? And if it's a Greek wedding, you better believe there's going to be a lot of walnuts there because they just love walnuts. Can't get enough baklava at the Greek wedding. But I like Greek weddings because you break dishes and shit. Now, the FSA's warning about these Wonka bars comes after a sharp increase in reports of the counterfeit chocolate bars on sale over the past year, as a matter of fact. Uh... There's a quote here. It says, there is no way of knowing what ingredients are in these Wonka bars or what the food hygiene practices are being followed by the people making or repackaging them. If you have bought these knockoff Wonka bars, do not eat them or give them to friends and family. Don't eat the Wonka bars. Don't look for the golden ticket. It's a fictional place. The chocolate factory doesn't exist. Well, what can we do as citizens? We want Wonka bars. How do we avoid eating an unregistered Wonka bar? Well, what you need to do is look for the official Ferrero or Ferrara Candy Company trademark on the label. If it doesn't have that, it is likely to be a counterfeit product, and there is no way to know if it is even safe to eat. The Food Standards Agency is continuing to investigate. They're looking for this rogue Charlie with his fake chocolate factory. And while we're at it, watch out for those fake schnozberries that are being sold at these farmer's markets all across the world. Schnozberry? Who's ever heard of a schnozberry? I said, doctor, is there nothing I can take? I said, doctor, to relieve this belly ache. What up, y'all? Live from the closet. It's Jonesy with another episode of Weird AF News. Highly caffeinated today, boys and girls, or whatever you identify with. Uh, We ran through the stories today, lightning fast. I want to give a shout out. Give thanks and praise. Pete Ebdel from Adelaide, Australia. Pete and I were talking on Instagram. Pete has an amazing job. He drives trucks in an underground mine. I was like, shut the hell up, Pete. I don't believe that you drive trucks in an underground mine. He was like, I do, bro. 
I said, you send me some video or photos of this. And he did. He sent me two videos, man. They were intense. This guy's far underground driving trucks. It was outrageous. Outrageous. That video was amazing. Pete seems like a fun guy. He enjoys that job, it seems like. Wow, man. Got a nice glimpse into the center of the earth, thanks to Pete from Australia. I got some really cool listeners, man. Like you. You're a pretty cool listener. Uh, what else? Oh, I keep getting photos of people's tattoos, by the way. Thank you. I got some pretty cool tattoos, you guys. If you guys want to send me some stuff, it's funnyjones at gmail.com. If you want to call the show, it's 646-450-2012. I'm going to publish calls after this outro. FYI. So if you want to stick around and listen to them, cool. If you got things to do, we understand. If you guys want to contribute to to Jonesy's production here by uh, you know keeping me caffeinated, buying me some coffee, you can go to patreon.com slash weirdafnews. Join the Patreon. Get some extra content and get that good feeling knowing that you're, you're supporting a giant conglomerate called Weird AF News <laughs> that's taking over the media landscape as we speak. And it all started in this closet. Yeah. Or go to weirdafnews.com and just click on the Patreon banner. Yeah, send me some coffee, man. Keep me in this state of mind. Why don't you? Come on, do it. You know you want to. Please. Hey, Jonesy. This is Julianne from Ames, Iowa. I want to thank you for helping me get through some dark times in my life. And I always, always appreciate you. Humor. Keep up the great work. The reason why I'm calling she had a story about a gay dog. A couple wanted to give the gay dog away because they thought he was gay. Don't they know when you take a pet, it's a forever animal? And by the time they were giving their dog away, my precious Australian, Australian Shepherd Border Collie, Skiff, is over 10 years old, went over the Rainbow Bridge. And I would do a whole lot just to be able to hug and love him one more time. I'm glad the dog is in a better place with his new family. But as for the being gay, I did an ethics class a few years back. And I did a paper on the top topic, and it seems like in the human and the animal kingdom that 10% at least are gay and that there was a biological reason for this. There are parents that die and leave orphan children whether it's human or in the animal kingdom, and they helped with that. Anyway, you keep up the great work. Again, you are appreciated. Bye. Jonesy, you rock and roller. What's happening, man? It's your buddy Jim from Cleveland giving you a call to congratulate you. Not one, but two. Wow, you are rocking and rolling getting a lot of people uh, more aware of what you're doing with your podcast. Very proud of you. goes to show you that uh, if you set your mind to things, you can be very successful. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I would more lean towards the Red Hot Chili Peppers in karaoke being a band or being a uh, band that, does other material than tool. Sorry, man, I got a little place for the chili peppers a little more. Fight like a brave. And you're fighting on your podcast, and you're letting people know about the news, the crazy news we have. Doing a fine job, my friend, and all the people that support you and love you. You know, I might not send you money, Jonesy, but uh, I've told quite a few people about your podcast so hopefully that counts for something man love you doing a great job hopefully you're staying safe there speak to you later your friend jim from cleveland ohio home of the super bowl champion soon that's right we will have a super bowl team now that we have a quarterback take care and we will speak to you later my friend Hey, Jonesy, it's Luna from, uh, I can't speak, sorry, Luna from Texas, and, um, well, I didn't get to listen to the Florida Friday episode until well, today, Monday, hey, March 28th, but, hey, and I listened to the episode you posted today, today as well, and, um, 
Congratulations on hitting 2 million downloads. Let everyone, everyone, tell everyone in the world about this. Weird AF news needs to take over all of the mainstream news. Take it over, take it over, end of the mainstream news, and get Jonesy completely famous for Weird AF news. Okay, with that out of the way, you know how you couldn't, for whatever reason, didn't find um what yen would be what Japanese yen would be in U.S. dollars, 10,000 Japanese yen is $80.89 in U.S. dollars, okay? So that also is something. And so with that, Luna from Texas is out. Good luck with your life, man. Hey, Jonesy, it's Michael calling from Iowa City. Uh, to comment on a story from earlier this week about the family that was suing, suing the funeral home because their male family member had been um, cremated rather than having the body left whole. And the family was concerned that when the Lord returns with his second coming on earth, that the body wouldn't be able to be raptured because he was cremated. And my comment on that is that that should not be a concern for the family because if the Lord can raise people from the dead, he can certainly restore their bodies to their former glory. Uh, there are certainly people that have been buried for hundreds of years, you know, whether they're in uh, just placed right into the ground directly or put into a wooden casket or even, you know, in standard type of caskets that we have now, those things are going to break down, corrode, and the bodies are basically going to become worm food, as you pointed out, uh, over the years. So if he can raise people from the dead, he can restore their bodies, whether they're worm food or whether they've been cremated. So uh, that should not be an issue for a body that's been cremated. The Lord will be able to restore them. So anyhow, the uh, issue here is um, they don't really need to, to worry about that. Anyhow, the, uh, the other thing is that as you went to the outro, uh, you used saying rapture and I agree. I picked up on that. That's your reference to the Blondie song, uh, rapture. And that's from their, uh, single from, uh, 19, ooh, 81 in January of 1981. Uh, actually March is when it went to number one on the rap singles chart. So. Um, just in case people didn't know, here you go. This is it. Rapture. Do people remember that song? That's uh, the first rap song to go number one on the charts. Uh, of course, it wasn't until 1987, that entire album, uh, Beastie Boys, Licensed to Ill, became number one on the Hot 100, and that's for the entire album in 1987. But Blondie had the first single in 1981, the song Rapture. So I just wanted to point that out, and I did get your reference that you were singing there, uh, Jonesy Rapture. All right, that's what I wanted to call about. Have a good weekend, everyone, and good luck with your life, man. Uh, hello, Mr. Jonesy. My name is Daniel Ford, and I have an egg-laying production facility here in Indiana, and I've just recently woken up from the anesthesia for my surgery, and I'd like the opportunity to clear my name with what's happened here. I understand you reported on uh, what this situation, and I'd like to clear my name. So the, exactly what happened here is I was in, in the hen house, and uh, there's lots of things to be maintained, equipment. It's just all squeaky all the time, and parts have to be oiled. You know, these eggs are dropping down in chutes and rolling down into the collection containers, and these parts have to be oiled. So I was refilling my oil can from a gallon bucket, and the whole dang thing, what do you know, it didn't spill all over me, and my clothes were soaked clean through. I was just absolutely soaked with oil. I had to remove my clothing and my whole entire body from the waist down was just soaked with machinery oil and it spilled all over the floor, floor as well. I went to get some uh, towels to mop up the area and what do you know, I don't slip on the floor 
and as I'm falling, I knock over a couple of hen, uh, hen cages, and, uh, and they got swept under me, and as I fell, apparently I I had a, a hen that got inserted up into my rectum, and I fell on the floor and hit my head, and I was knocked clean out, and I wasn't found for some time until another worker came along and found me. So it sounds like I was doing some kind of pervert thing, but it was just the case where I was all greased up and a, a hen got inserted into my rectum. It was a terrible thing for both me and the hen, and I'm trying to clear my name so that the people in my area, as well as across the United States don't think of me as some kind of animal abuser. So I just needed to explain this so people would understand. So that's the way that situation happened. So I need people to understand that I'm not some sort of animal abuser. This would ruin my my uh, good name and my my business. So please understand that. And so I've also come to understand that there's a, a woman over in in Britain Great Britain, England, and her name is Williams, and apparently uh, I recall meeting her about 10 years ago, and she got uh, her name tattooed on, my name tattooed on her butt. So if you're over there looking for me, I'm here, Daniel Ford in, in Indiana, and Jonesy, maybe you can put us together and make that connection, because I do remember that that night I was at a bachelor party over there in Spain, and uh, I got her to tattoo my name on her butt. So uh, I'm still single. Maybe uh, we could get connected together. So I would like to.